In the name of the God who creates, who redeems, and who sanctifies. Amen. Amen. I guess we don't need two minutes. So I, I wasn't able to be with you all last week during the Feast of All Saints. I saw a little bit online and I heard it was a very beautiful and moving service. And I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here. Some of you may have heard that last week I was at my older son's wedding. Um, so I was attending a very different but equally moving and beautiful event. Uh, this was actually their second wedding, not because anything bad happened in between that one and the first one, but because their first ceremony was during the pandemic. Um, so it was necessarily scaled down and with only very close friends and family uh, in attendance. Even so, I approached this wedding with a little bit of hesitancy. You know, how necessary really was a second ceremony? And I wondered about all the time and expense of having so many people travel to Austin, Texas to solemnize something that they've been living into very well, in my opinion, for the last two years. I needn't have worried. It was clear from the moment we arrived that this was their real wedding. Taking nothing away from that first ceremony, which I was very fond of, this was the joyful and spiritual moment that made everything more special and more beautiful. The love everywhere was just palpable for the entire wedding from start to finish, and the community around the couple was just amazing. So knowing I had to preach today and seeing that it was about the ten bridesmaids, I said, we got us a wedding in our subject. This is really fortuitous. I'll certainly have something to say about this. I think in looking a bit closer, I'm thinking this was a very different kind of wedding. Um, wanting quite a bit of contrast to the one I had just attended. In this wedding, the bridegroom is so late that people start falling asleep. The bride's not mentioned at all. Usually the bride is at the center of the tension, but the bride is nowhere to be seen in this story. And rather than a story of inclusion and community, we have a party whose guest list seems to be determined by how much combustible fuel they chose to buy. <laughs> the guests who are allowed to attend are stingy in their, in their oil and refuse to share. Clearly, these bridesmaids have not had enough time to bond. They should have gone to a bachelorette party or a shower or something like that and had that time. So, what's going on here? Why is Jesus painting such a dour picture of this woman? So, this parable falls in a series of teachings on the Mount of Olives, responding to the disciples' question about the coming of the end of the age. And it is from these teachings as well as from our readings from Paul, where we find much of the church's theology has come from about this notion of the second coming of Christ, or in Greek, the parousia. Jesus tells a series of parables and prophecies about what the end of days will be like and how to prepare for it. And to be honest, it's kind of harsh and confusing series of examples and instructions full of very final pronouncements and dire punishments. The phrase, much weeping and gnashing of teeth, is mentioned several times. And it's here where we get a whole lot of dogma that many Christians still about today. A God of judgment and wrath, who will at some specified time in the future, at the end times, will come in great fury, destroy the world and the wicked in it, and take the faithful straight to heaven. Indeed, our parable for today very much seems to indicate some kind of distinction. Some people are going to be in, and some people are going to be out. The kingdom of heaven will not be open to all. The door will be shut. The bridegroom will declare, I do not know. But in this parable, at least, the criteria are very confusing. The only difference between the bridesmaids that get into the banquet and those that don't that they have been wise enough to buy oil. There's no behavioral or ethical consideration. In fact, you could argue that the bridesmaids that are allowed to go in are kind of wicked because they don't share. It is mostly an exhortation to keep awake. 
which is also kind of befuddling because just a little while ago, everybody was asleep. So this is a perfect example of why it's important to really wrestle with these parables and not jump to the surface interpretation. We don't think that, that, that God is telling us to, that, that, that we shouldn't share, for example. Um, and in preparing for this homily, I read a lot of what people had to say about it. I do that when I prepare for all my homilies. And <laughs> people far more qualified with, than I, people with reverend and doctor in front of their names and MDiv after their names, went straight for this kind of meaning that in one way or another has God shutting the door on at least some of God's children. With all deference to my elders and theologians who have come before me, I will stand up here and quietly say, this is just bunk. <laughs> it does not square with so many foundational ten tenets of our faith. Most importantly, that God is love and that we are God's children and that God loves us more than we can possibly imagine. <laughs> At last week's much preferable wedding, my wonderful mother, who is recovering from knee surgery and in her 80s, still managed to travel to Austin, Texas from Colorado and made her way to the lectern to read the famous passage from 1 Corinthians. She reminds us, and we need this reminding every day, that love never fails. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So in doing any sort of biblical exegesis or interpretation, you have to proceed from an originating thesis, a framework from which to store, and that necessarily and drastically affects where you will go. I'll just tip my hand. My thesis for you today, and every day I preach for you, will be that God is love, and that love never fails. So let's return to this crazy parable and look at it through that lens. Clearly Jesus is trying to make some distinction between the wise and the foolish, about having oil and not having oil. And the context is in the imminent arrival of a very important presence. Well, what more important eminent presence could be coming to us than Jesus Christ himself. You see, the second coming of Christ, this perusia we've been talking about, has already happened, is happening now, and will continue to happen going forward. Every day since the ascension, when we were able to name and recognize that we are the body of Christ, we have shown that the love of God arrives every single day. So how do we keep awake? How do we trim our lamps? We ignite those lamps with the light of welcome in the knowledge that we are part of a joyous community, a human family, and participate in the relationships that we were created for. We are all welcome at the wedding banquet at God's table. But what keeps us from it? How does that door to the show? I think it's when we are separating ourselves by, from that gift by our own brokenness. When we fail to see and honor the divine in each other, when that happens, the oil in our lamps is run out and we are in the dark. We are not our authentic selves. So when we look in the mirror, we say, I do not know you. The bridegroom transforms from an all-loving parent into a harsh inner voice so often that speaks to us out of our damaged selves. The parable becomes less a confusing finger wag by some arbitrarily late bridegroom and more an exhortation to remember who we really are, that we are children of love made for love. It's an exhortation to procure the oil which lights that banquet hall in our hearts, to welcome and be welcomed by love. So maybe not so bad, this wedding of Jesus. But I'm so glad I was where I was last weekend. But I'm also glad to be back in this place, doing this work. 
Because I think we do a great job of keeping each other's lamps lit and doing the work of the kingdom. Let us pray. <coughs> Loving God, make our hearts ready to receive your presence in our lives and in our communities. Fill our lamps with the oil of love and trust and grace that we may be more fully your body, your hands and feet in this suffering world. All this we ask in the name of our brother Jesus.